Okay, everyone, let's go ahead and get started this evening. Let me give that to you first, sign in. Can I start the sign in with you guys? Thank you uh, for making time to be here this evening. I know it's been a long day. It's getting dark at like 4.30. What's going on? I hate that. Uh, I want to welcome all of our online folks as well. Uh, I do have some prayer requests and announcements for us as we begin. Dean Coomer is recovering from acute sinusitis and pneumonia. Uh, Bill Cooper is recovering after having gallbladder surgery and the flu. And I heard uh, through second hand today that Marge said they are doing a lot better. So happy about that. Kathy Dowdy requests prayers for strength and patience as she cares for her parents for the next few weeks. Anything else? And, for me. <laughs> and strength and patience for you as well. Yeah, for you absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. Uh, but Wally Dyke continues in rehab. Uh, if you remember last week, we shared about Eileen Hufford having that complete hearing loss. And they're waiting a few weeks to see if the medications and injections she received are going to work, are going to stick. So just um, kind of waiting with, with our breaths held for that. Um, we're very prayerful for Alechi, whose body is showing signs of rejecting the bone marrow transplant. Um, so she's taking some new medication that hopefully will counteract what's happening. So just very prayerful that, that those medications work. Um, in just over a week, that the sort of the, the deadline or the time when they were going to determine whether it had, it had worked or not. So they're very, uh, very anxious about that upcoming date. Ronnie Martin, uh, Joe McDaniel's brother, had a massive stroke last week and is out of ICU now, but still completely paralyzed on his left side. Dana Pettigo, Juliana Steersman's mother, begins chemo treatments November 11th for cancer that has spread to her lymph nodes. Cindy Ray, Donna Bain's sister-in-law, requests prayers for rest and recovery. Vincent and Scalzo just continued prayers for them with their ongoing health issues. Uh, Peggy Turner, Don Gamble's niece, we had announced last week that she had been put on a ventilator. This week she's off the ventilator and doing better, still, uh, I believe, still in the hospital. So very thankful for that progress, continued prayers. And then lastly, uh, Seth and Jenna Turner, uh, the youth minister here and his wife, um, it sounds like we'll be expecting little Finley tomorrow. Um, they're going to go in 8 o'clock tomorrow, and if Jenna's blood pressure um, is anything like it has been the past couple weeks, being very high, then they're going to go ahead with the C-section. Um, and she's far enough along that ideally both she and, and little Finley will be okay. So prayerful for that. Um, only announcement is the weekly prayer prompt that Landon provides, just very thoughtfully uh, encouraging us to spend time in prayer, naming any fears, worries, concerns that you have for this church family. Um, about the minister search, just anything related to that, inviting God to bring comfort and direction. Okay. Those are all the prayer requests and announcements. Let me begin us with a prayer this evening. Our holy God, you are worthy of praise. We love you. And we're thankful for who you are, for what you have done, what you are doing, and what by the promise of Jesus Christ and guarantee of the Spirit you are going to do. We do await that perfect future and pray that you would come quickly. We know that until then you are always with us. I pray for that reminder, for the eyes to see that, 
for everyone gathered here tonight, online or in person, that as we bring exhaustion and stress and highs and lows, that we would have the eyes to see you are with us, that you never leave us nor forsake us, and that you are working for our good. We also lift up those we just mentioned on the prayer list. Just pray for their healing, comfort, strength, deliverance. We especially lift up Alechi as we've been earnestly praying for her over the past few months. And just pray for good progress to be made um, as her body receives the transplant. And we also pray a blessing over the Turner family as they potentially welcome their daughter into this world tomorrow. I pray that you are at work, God, by your Spirit tonight, that you would just grant to us a deeper love for your creation, for ourselves, that we might lift that love back up to you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, so if this is um, the first time you're in this series, let, let me just catch you up on kind of the big ideas. So last week was the first class of this new series, um, just not very creatively called Christian Sexuality. Um, and we're teaching this class because we realize sexuality is often misconceived and, and even broken, both in the, in the world, outside of these walls, but even in our churches. And, and so we kind of unpacked that last week. And our goal for this course is, instead of some conversations about the brokenness of sexuality, that wag fingers and say, that, you know, they need to figure it out, how dare they? And, and it's negative. Instead, we're going to spend time to develop a positive vision that we can offer to the world and, and how much more beautiful and winsome. You know, so uh, the big idea as we um, did that, that number one class, the introduction last week, the big idea uh, as we asked ourselves, well, what is sexuality as far as the Bible is concerned, as far as we see um, in who God is? And this is sort of a conglomeration of what we see in the text, which we'll dive into more today, and, and also some really important literature about this uh, from authors like Stanley Grenz, who wrote sort of the, the Bible just called Sexual Ethics um, regarding this topic. Uh, authors like um, Juliana Slattery, who wrote a book, Rethinking Sexuality, or Jonathan Grant, Divine Sex, just, just to say this is not something I just threw on a PowerPoint slide. The, this, these ideas are drawn from really wise people thinking about these and ultimately from the text. And so we said um, sexuality, as we see from a Christian perspective, is the capacity God built into being human. And it's more than just being attracted to the other sex. It's more than your anatomy or your gender. Uh, it's more than your sexual activity, it's, but it's this larger um, capacity to know another person and to be known. And the reason that we call this sexuality and not just friendship is because it's specifically related to you being a male or a female and how the way you relate to the world is, is influenced by that. And, and we'll talk about that tonight. This means that every person has a sexuality, whether you're sexually active or not, whether you're single or married, it's part of what it means to be a human being, and you can't remove it from yourself. And it has detrimental consequences if we do try to throw it in the trash. Now, we ask ourselves, well, why did God build this in, into humans? Why, why not just create 
uh, people, and there's neither male nor female, there's just people. He, he purposely creates as he did with these distinctions, and it seems, he says in Genesis 1, so that we might be made in his image and reflect who he is, together as male and female. And ultimately, it's because he is a, he is a God who desires to know and be known. So you see how this reclaims sexuality as something beautiful and good and rooted in who God is. So we're, as every series starts off, it's more heavy on the theory. You've, you've got to build your ideas before then you get to the concrete. So I realize this is a lot of theory, this is more abstract, and I, I tried to diagram it a little bit. Maybe this is helpful. So a person's sexuality is you being your, your gender, you being male or female. And from that flows the unique way that you relate to and connect with the world because of your, your gender. And that together comprises your sexuality. If you remove the, the first box and we're just talking about how you relate to and connect with the world, you might just call that friendship or love or relationship. But it actually diminishes something God is very intentional to build into being human, and that is your, your maleness or your femaleness. If you remove the second box and it, it, you're only thinking about your, your gender and your anatomy and your biology, it's too narrow of a definition and you're not realizing how those things actually influence how I relate to people. And so sexuality tries to bring both of these together. And, and so that's the word that, that we use to describe these. What we're going to do today then is is look at the text, look at the life of Jesus, and say, um, how does God design sexuality? What's its purpose? And how is it affirmed? So let's begin in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. This is the account of God creating everything. And it takes him six days to create everything, and on the sixth day, he creates people. So it says in verse 27, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. And notice this. This, this is explaining what it means to be made in God's image. Male and female. He created them. This is very purposeful. And this is related to reflecting who God is, apparently. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So what we see is that God very purposely says, I'm going to create humanity in male and female forms. And he's saying, I'm doing this because together they show the world who I am. They reflect my image to the world. Now this is pretty important for how we function as a community. That the, the world will not see the fullness of God if it does not see men and women partnering together. And you as a person will not experience the fullness of who God is if you do not have a meaningful relationship with someone of the opposite sex. It is both male and female together that comprise the fullness of God's image. So th this really calls for community to understand who God is. It's this beautiful picture. Now, we understand this, even in how the, the words are used in the English language. That there is this, this overlap, the, this, this togetherness, 
in, in man and woman, in male and female. We even see in the words. And this is reflected even in the language that Genesis chapter 1 is written in, Hebrew, where the word for man is ish, and the word for woman is isha. And you, you see how they're built into each other, you know. It's this reminder even in the language that we, we cannot do life without the other. Um, so there is, there is a similarity. There is a, a unity, a togetherness. And, and yet, also, there is a difference. And really, what we're going to do tonight is try to push back on the extremes when we talk and think about sexuality when the world either wants to claim the, the similarity and erase all distinctions, or on the other hand, the other extreme is to say that we are complete opposites. And, and the difference between man and woman is, is insurmountable. And what, you know, what we see in the text is, is there's this middle ground with a, a yes and a both and. That there is togetherness and complementary difference. Now, let me share this, um, this notion, especially for Old Testament people in Hebrew thought. When they look at a person, they're not saying, here's, here's a person with uh, many parts of, of them. And one of those parts is, is more themselves than the other. That's more Greek thinking, where we say, here's a person, and inside of them is uh, a, a little ghost called the soul. And really, they're just wearing a shell of a body. And the ghost of a soul is the true you that, that you need to find and unleash. That, that's more of a, a Greek way to think about the world. As far as the Old Testament authors are concerned, you look at a person and mind, body, soul, it, it all comprises being a person, and you can't separate them from, from one another. So, have you ever heard of a command in the Bible called the Shema? From Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, sometimes we sing the song, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And what does it say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your soul. And what the Shema is doing, this Greek word which means hear or listen, what that command is doing is saying, love God with all that you are. It's a very Hebrew way to think about it. These, these components of yourself um, are, are all called to together love and follow God. The reason I say this is, let me connect it back, is because sexuality cannot be separated from the self. Sexuality is, is built into what it means to be human. And our world, and even in our churches, make attempts to separate our sexuality from ourself, and it's harmful. This is, we especially see this in how women are perceived. That on one hand, to, um, let, let's just keep it in a church context, to push back against lust and objectifying women, that women are actually stripped of their sexuality entirely. And so our young women are given a, a hyper-modesty and purity culture that actually makes them ashamed of their bodies and their sexuality. We, we see this in our, our young women even today. And, and it doesn't acknowledge the, the, the beautiful 
of sexuality built into every person. You know, it just throws it in the trash, and you see how harmful that is. Of course, um, here's, here's another example. In some Eastern cultures, in an attempt to push back against objectifying a woman, they will ask a woman to cover themselves entirely. And one might think, oh, how, how respectful they are trying to protect the, the woman's body and uh, how a woman is perceived. But in reality, it is to say women are, are only sexual objects. And if that's their, their primary role, then we better cover them up. You see how it's, and it's, it's an extreme. Now, on the other hand, we see this one more readily in our culture, is to make your sexuality the, the only thing that matters when, when you think about yourself, and to blow it out of, out of proportion. So that, again, women are, are often the victims of this in our... TV ads, and in our party culture, and in our fashion and style industry, that women are seen as objects or commodities instead of human beings who are, are more than their sexuality or their bodies, you know? So this is why I say all of this. There are these two extremes that are both, the, the root cause of these is to separate your sexuality from yourself and, and either throw it in the trash or, or make it the only thing that matters. And what we see in Scripture is actually th this well-rounded understanding of sexuality as a good, beautiful thing God built into being human that, that needs to be affirmed and celebrated. But ultimately, it's because we're made in the image of God. And that's truly what, def what defines our identity. Um, okay, let me share a quote that maybe makes more sense of this than, than I've been making, and then I want to hear you process this together. So one author says, our maleness or our femaleness is not incidental to our humanness. It's, it's not something that can be separated from you being human. It constitutes its very essence. To, to be male or to be female, that's part of who you are inseparably. God does not make us into a generic humanity that is later differentiated, that, that is later Okay, let me pick some to be male, some to be female. He purposely creates male and female from the beginning. We start that way. Every cell in our body is stamped as an XX or XY chromosome. And, and here's why this matters. This means I cannot understand myself if I try to ignore the way God has designed me. If I throw what it means to be a man into the trash, and don't acknowledge it, and don't explore it, and don't understand it. Or, if I despise the gifts he may have given to help me fulfill my calling. If I don't explore, what, what are the ways that me being a man actually reflect who God is? Okay. Um, I want to sort of keep developing this, this idea, but any questions or comments about this so far? I know it's a lot of theory. It's very, very needed, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Middle schoolers are like the most confused people in the world right now. <laughs> One told yeah. me there were like 50, 50 genders or something like that. Okay. Right. Pillars quote maybe at least three or four together. Yeah. All God designed to give. Yes. I'm going to be better about repeating comments tonight so online folks can hear it. So Keith was saying um, 
what did you say, middle schoolers are the most confused people in the world right now. <laughs> and a lot of this stems from um, this, this misconception of, of what it means to be a person and, and what it means to be fundamentally male or female. Yeah. So here's where now we accept that God has, has built this into creation. And here's where he begins to explain how this plays out, how this impacts our mission. So he blesses them, and so what's the mission that God gives to humanity? To, to be fruitful, multiply, kind of saying the same thing, and to reign over creation. Now, the amazing thing about this is God is essentially saying, do what I'm doing. Uh, because is not God being fruitful and multiplying when it, he creates people in his image? He's creating li little hymns, male and female both, to fill the, fill the world. And he says, you do that too. And it is not God king over the universe? Is he not the one who reigns? And he says, humanity, you do that too. Reign over what I have given you. So the fundamental mission of being a human being, as we see, is to reflect who God is by how we interact with each other and with creation. To be fruitful, multiply, reign over the fish in the sea. Now notice, this command is given both to man and woman. This is to say that we cannot accomplish this mission without people of the opposite sex being a part of our community. And I think this is maybe an encouraging word, especially to women, who from my experience, from what I've heard, especially in our Southern American culture, which can trend a little more patriarchal, women often wonder, do I have a place in the kingdom? Am, am I just as important, important as my male counterparts in the church. And from the beginning, God says, yes, absolutely. That it is man and woman together who both rule over creation and reflect who I am. So we, we've got to be together in this. Now, we're, so you might say we are co-commissioned. This also means we are codependent. That, that we cannot say, I can do this on my own as a man or as a woman. We are codependent on the other. It reminds us, even of this deeper truth, that as a human being, you cannot do life alone. You, you need God. You need community. And I think this is part of what God purposely builds into being human, is that either as a male or a female, you can't do the whole thing on your own. So it's a, it's a reminder of, about our dependence on God and, and each other. So all this to say, God created male and female to be different in some ways. And, and this can be uh, a challenging statement in the way that our world currently perceives of sexuality. We want to uphold the difference. And yet, we also want to uphold, we are united and codependent in our purpose to reflect God's image. It, you, know, you know, you see how this is a both and. Now, this means that our female or male sexuality reflects who God is. Shows, shows the world who God is. 
I think one way it does this is, is that God is showing the world um, as your creator, there is difference within me, and yet there is unity. And it's, it's really a teaching about God as Father, Son, and Spirit, about Him as triune, as three persons in one substance. This is played out in God making male and female as different, and yet a, a necessity of being together in their mission. Now, we also see male and female sexuality point us to God in the way that God lives out what are generally more male characteristics or manifestations and also what are more female characteristics. It's easier for us to recall the ways in Scripture that God is represented as masculine. He is called a father. He is depicted as a warrior. He is depicted as a king, which in ancient Near East context is a male role. And so those are on the tip of our tongue. But what I want to show is that God has no gender. God has no body. He transcends all of this. And our genders and our sexuality point to God who is above these things. And so there are also times in Scripture that God lives out what are generally female qualities or characteristics. And this is a reminder that as a female, with female sexuality, you're doing just as powerful of, of a showing of who God is. So here are some examples. Um, God, in Deuteronomy, cares for Israel, and it's likened to an eagle that stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them, carries them on its pinions. This is God being depicted as uh, a mother eagle, caring for her children. In keeping with this imagery, the Hebrew poets repeatedly speak of the refuge available, in the shadow of your wings, is a phrase used a lot, especially in the Psalms. And this is a feminine image of a, a hen or a, a mother bird gathering her chicks under her wings. Jesus reflects this in what he says to Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 23. He says, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You see how in these ways, God is being depicted with feminine roles or characteristics. Uh, here are a few more, several in the book of Isaiah. God says, I reared children and brought them up. It's an image of God giving birth, but they have rebelled against me. Uh, but later, it says the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. This compassion in the book of Isaiah is understood as a, a motherly compassion. For example, later in Isaiah, God asks, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she was born? He's comparing his compassion and his love to that of a mother. And he says, M mine is even deeper. Though in the worst case scenario, she may forget, I will never forget you. So, and, and there are several more. Hosea chapter 11, and, and we could attack a few more on. God is often depicted um, with feminine or female qualities or roles. Um, often as a mother. So uh, this may be another good reminder that as a woman, um, even specifically as a mother, the way that, that you, you live out who you are is absolutely showing the world who God is. And, and you are not less than in, in any way 
when it comes to being able to glorify God and reflect his image to the world. Now, it, it does then make us ask the question, um, if there are differences, and if these differences are good because they reflect who God is, what, what are they? What, what are these differences between being male and female? And how can we, again, stay out of the two ditches of um, stereotypes that make people fit into boxes, otherwise they're not man enough or woman enough? And also the other ditch of saying, well, there are no differences, and, and just erasing the, the distinctions entirely. Maybe there's a middle road here. Um, these differences show up on several levels. Let me go ahead and interrupt myself. Any, any questions or, or comments so far? Okay. These differences are represented on, on several levels. The, the foundational fundamental level is on an anatomical biological level. That there are anatomical differences between a man and a woman. Your, your bodies look differently. And as Christians, we believe God designed it this way. And those differences are, are, good, are equally good and must not be erased. Now, because of your biology and anatomy as either a man or a woman, this means that there are different hormones and chemicals flowing through your body. And this affects how your body develops, both on a neurological level, in your mind. Studies show that, that men's minds and women's minds are anatomically different in some ways. Um, but it also affects very generally um, your, your stature um, and, and the, the traits that, that flow from that. Um, on the, now on the most outward level, all of these things affect how you relate to the world socially. And so, again, we're speaking in generalities, hopefully not stereotypes, and affirming that there are generally ways that men relate to the world, relate to each other, relate to stress and conflict and fear that are in some ways different than how women relate to those things. And there's the question of, well, is this nature or is this nurture? And I hope we're in the habit of saying both and to, to most things. But the differences must not be erased. So uh, let me share uh, some people who are a lot smarter than I have, who have affirmed some of these differences through psychology, through science, and through some pretty diligent studies. Um, one psychologist affirms men and women think differently. They even dream differently. Yeah, that first sentence is like, definitely, <laughs> I've experienced that one. Even dream differently. And this difference in the way of thinking is because of differing brain development that you can even see in little boys compared with little girls. That our, our brains, in some ways, are different. Women, on average, generally, are more readily able to use both sides of their brain. Do you know there are two sides of your brain? Left side, ref, uh, left side right side. Left side is more analytical, um, more verbal, logical. The, the right side is more emotional, intuitive, creative. And it, women, studies have shown, are uh, more quickly able to use both of those at the same time. <laughs> yeah, something was yeah bound to happen. 
Um, this means that men can specialize in um, single tasking, the opposite of multitasking, and analytical thinking generally. And uh, women can do a little better at holistic thinking and multitasking. Um, these, and again, these studies show the reason our brains are different, the reason we, we think differently and, and handle our responsibilities differently is traced back to the hormones that control our physical development and functioning. So it's traced back to this purposeful design of God that we are male and female. Um, here are a few more. Um, one widely held view characterizes men as being more linear and rational. And women, on the other hand, are oriented to a network of relationships. Um, so one psychologist, Carol Gilligan, has declared that women tend to define their identity through relationships. Uh, rather than through assertion and aggression. Other psychologists suggest, uh, just so, sort of putting this in other words, uh, core properties of femininity are a sense of communion, kind of that you know, relational orientation, whereas those for masculinity are a sense of agency, leaning more toward a desire for control and initiation, kind of that Lone Ranger stereotype. These are played out in, in real ways in our world. It's a demonstrable fact, at least in the United States, that men have less meaningful friendship than women do. In studies done, it's demonstrable that men, even across cultural landscapes, are sexually more active and are more aggressive than women. And that if either sex is to have more than one sexual partner, it's almost always the man. So, these, these are generalities that in our cultural climate will be called stereotypes, and I think they can be used that way, will be called putting people in the boxes, but I think the call as Christians is to not obliterate all generalities. Uh, to, as one, one author says, to recognize and accept that generalities exist, while also allowing deviation from the typical to a certain extent. So this is where we're, we're trying to do the, the middle road, not either extreme, is to, to affirm there are differences between being a man and a woman. And, and yet, we cannot put a definition of being a man into so small of a box that a, a man who... Um, is artistic or is able to uh, access their emotions or is a good listener now all of a sudden is less of a man or on the other hand a woman who is able to tap into a sense of anger and assertion is now all of a sudden less of a woman you see how there's there's some flexibility here and the call is to say, when all of these characteristics are practiced in a healthy way, um, aggression and compassion, here, here are the stereotypes, um, a sense of uh, desire to fight versus a desire to nurture and interconnect. And, and, you know, and you can pit these against each other. And the call instead is to say, we see God reflected in all of those things. And they're all good and beautiful. They all comprise what together is, as man and woman, it is to be humans and to reflect God's image. And all those things can be celebrated. 
not, not thrown away, not pitted against each other. I hope this makes sense. There's an invitation to celebrate the image of God in each of these generalities. Um, so let me, let me share a couple examples. I think our churches struggle with what to do with um, generally, especially in Southern American churches, people who don't fit the, the boxes, you know? What, what do our churches do with effeminate men or masculine women? And I, and I think our churches have communicated to those people at times that who they are is unacceptable and they are less than a man or a woman because they're able to lean into these other qualities instead of celebrating these and embracing them. We're not obliterating distinctions or differences, but allowing for a, a certain amount of flexibility. Um, a, a more concrete example, I forgot if I read this or saw this in an interview. Um, one of the women in uh, television sports casting said that women are put in this really impossible situation if you, if you want to get on TV and, and have a name for yourself. And that is, you, you want to look good and you want to be sexy and you, you want to appear um, dainty and cute for the world, uh, but, but not too much so. And at the same time, you've got to be able to be one of the boys and embrace these, these masculine qualities, but not too much so. Otherwise, it'll appear threatening or off-putting. And, and she was saying how unfair this, this standard we're called to. And, and do you see how th this is the, the harmful outworking of not celebrating um, how, how these generalities and how being male and female actually reflect God? So I, I do want to affirm tonight that you are not less of a woman or less of a man. You are not strange if you don't fit all the stereotypical categories. And I would venture to say that no one does completely. That in fact, you are 100% a man or 100% a woman because that's how God designed you. It's, it's part of your identity and it's a good beautiful thing. It's not something to be ashamed of. What do we got for time? Okay. I've got uh, a question for us and then want to want to root this in Christ as we as we begin to wrap up. Given all of this, what would it look like to celebrate the ways God is reflected in male and female sexuality? To not obliterate the differences um, but also not put people in, into boxes. What, what are some examples of, of how we could do that? I'm not sure I understand what you're looking for, so that can be... Okay, maybe not a good question. Can't, making the forming good questions is, is one of the great challenges of, of a teacher I've learned. Yeah. Um, here's, here are some ideas that came to mind. Let's, as a church, have specific events for women, like ladies' days, like we do sometimes, and specific events for men to say we recognize the differences and we celebrate those and, and want to pour into those and empower those. And then also, as we do, come back together and be a community and say, those qualities together glorify, represent God. Um, one author says, this means that men and women together must carry out God's mandate to build civilization and culture. Both men and women are called to do science and art 
to build families and human communities. And you can fill in the blank. This is a way to, to celebrate God working through um, both male and female sexuality. Yeah. Just, just man, and it threw me off the first time. I was like, what, what's happening? It's so, so different from the stereotype. Right. Of, yeah. When they got kind of brutally honest and mm-hmm. a little tired, you know, that, that seemed, it seemed to be a combination. Yes. Yeah, Keith was sharing about how he's seen guys cry to a surprising extent at some of the, the guys' retreats he've done, he's done. Um, yeah, some of those stereotypes just, just don't hold up. You know, um, lots of studies have shown that men talk as just as much as women. Uh, so some of those stereotypes are, are simply that. Um, what, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Maggie's saying don't let society import its definition of maleness or femaleness, but instead hold to, to what we see reflected in God. Yeah. And I think that needs to be said a lot more in church and in classrooms than it is. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Part of what we're trying to do. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Huh. You know, it's like that could have been a perfectly reasonable conversation, but then it's like you made it weird. <laughs> you know? or, or like, yeah. oh, so you're really into flowers and you're a dude or something. I mean, mm-hmm. like, let that let that dude make it. Like, 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 like insofar as like meeting somebody where they are and not causing a, a speed bump. Yeah. Yes. Right. Julian, <laughs> uh, Julian was just making a great comment to not put an obstacle there where, where there doesn't need to be one, importing stereotypes on the, what people should like or what jobs they should have, just searching for a deeper connection. Yeah. Jesus kind of defies a lot of those stereotypes Yeah. Turn the other cheek, that is not, right. that is not masculine at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, it already clashes with stereotypes when we yeah. reflect them on its own side. Yes, that's good. Jesus defies those stereotypes in some ways. Yeah. Now, speaking of Jesus, what, what we see in Christ coming to this earth is that he says, um, I'm going to take on flesh. 
because it's worth redeeming. I'm, I'm going to take on the full human experience, including human sexuality, in, including human gender, and I'm not going to come as an asexual angel. I'm not going to come as a ghost. I'm, I'm going to embrace human sexuality because it's something that's good and beautiful and it's worth redeeming. So the, the coming of Christ, the incarnation of Christ, actually affirms the goodness and the God-glorifying power of human sexuality. This is why it's so important to affirm that Jesus, in fact, did take on flesh and, and all that entails. So that in 1 John 4, the author gives some, some pretty strong words against people who deny that Jesus had a body. So he says, that this is how we know if someone has the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Now, the truth about Jesus seems to be referring to that Christ came in a body. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. Look at how serious this is. To deny that Jesus had a body and took on flesh is actually to embody the spirit of the Antichrist. It's very serious. But the reason is because Jesus very personally embraced what it means to be a human being um, for, from the, the, most deeper, the, the deepest, most intangible level to, to the most external level, because it's all good and worth redeeming. Um, then what happens is Jesus doubles down on this in his resurrection. And the resurrected Jesus is not some ghost, is, is not some floating angel, but it is the body, he is the body of Jesus Christ, risen, still containing the, the scars from when he was nailed to the cross. And Jesus is very careful to point this out to his disciples. I'm not a ghost. That the resurrection affirms God's e e eternal purpose for human sexuality and, and for the body. God says, this is so good, I'm going to build this into the resurrection so it will last forever. So when Jesus appears to the disciples in Luke 24, he, he wants to show them he has a real body. He says, look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost. Because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet, and they stood, uh, they, still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. And then he does this little science experiment to show them that he has a real body. He says, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. It wasn't simply that Jesus was saying, uh, I'm hungry from all this rising from the dead business. You got, you got anything to eat? But Jesus purposefully, to prove that he has a real body, eats something in front of his disciples because ghosts can't do that. So Jesus is, is very sure to say, the resurrection, what, what God is building into eternity, includes the body, includes gender, sexuality, because it is good and something that God designed from the beginning. Okay. It's 7.30. Wow. Um, let me... Go ahead and wrap up class with a quick prayer, and then we'll be done. God, we give you thanks for your perfect design, and we do pray that you would help us more and more um, to understand what it means to be human, including our male and female selves, how that influences how we relate to this world, and ultimately how that reflects how good and beautiful and wonderful you are. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.